Welcome to my review for Paranoiac, a thriller which came out in 1963. This one was directed by Freddie Francis and written by Jimmy Sangster. Francis is someone who would go on to direct a number of horror films which I have seen from the 60s and 70s, some of them Hammer, some of them non-Hammer. Incidentally, you'll find all my other Hammer reviews in my Hammer playlist. And I'll also just quickly say that there will be spoilers today. There are a couple of twists in the second half of this film which may affect your enjoyment of it if you know about them going into the film having not seen it before. So this is a story about a rich family called the Ashbys who live in this village on the coast of England. The film doesn't come out and specifically tell us where this is but the whole thing was filmed in a place called the Isle of Purbeck, which isn't actually an island, it, it's sort of a peninsula which juts out on the south coast. I used to live in Gosport, which is a little bit too far up the coast for me to be familiar with this area, but looking at a map, the tip of the Isle of Purbeck is sufficiently far enough away from the nearest large towns and cities for, for me to at least believe that this was where the film was meant to be set. So our main character is Simon Ashby. He's a really brattish, snobby, rich kid who's never had a job in his life and he constantly gets drunk all the time. And when this tale begins, he is three weeks away from inheriting the family estate and all the money. His parents died when he was very young and since then the estate has been in the care of his aunt and this accounting office somewhere in the, in the nearby township. But just as he's starting to plan how much beer he can buy with all this money he's going to have. His long lost older brother, Tony, turns up and everything has suddenly changed. Now Tony supposedly killed himself when he was 15 by throwing himself off a cliff into the English Channel. He left a suicide note saying he was going to do this, but apparently he faked his own death. Now he's back and Simon Ashby is absolutely horrified as you can imagine. And the sister Elena, yes there's a sister, she's got mixed feelings about Tony suddenly coming back. The aunt is very suspicious about the new arrival, so is this, is this guy actually the long lost brother or is he an imposter? We will find out later on in the movie and there will be blood and there will be shenanigans, you can guarantee it. So as you can tell from that picture, this was shot in black and white. I normally try and avoid such films, but I'm going to try and change my attitude on that because I was completely immersed in Paranoiac within five minutes. I can't imagine this film being in colour. It absolutely suits being in black and white. It's a very dialogue heavy film. There's not really much action in it to speak of, but the acting performances in it across the board are phenomenal, especially from Oliver Reed. I have seen a number of films with him in it in recent years that have really impressed me. He was brilliant in Curse of the Werewolf, and even though he only had a small part in the Jekyll and Hyde film that Hammer did, he was great in that as well. But I think this is his best performance yet that I've seen. He's absolutely wonderful, especially near the end. I think for the first sort of two acts, He's mostly just playing his character as a really kind of boring, irritating snob. But once Simon's secrets start to come out into the open, the amount of emotion that Reed portrays on his face is just something else. I mean, this character, and we're getting into the spoilers now, is basically a double murderer. I mean, he killed his brother when he was younger, and, and during the events of this film, he kills his lover. We shouldn't feel any sympathy for this guy at all. I mean, he's just an evil creep, but I did anyway, and that just goes to show just, just how powerful the performance is. The sister, Elena, is played by Jeanette Scott. Now, I looked her up on Wiki after watching the film, and to my disappointment, it turns out that she, her career didn't really last. She sort of quit acting towards the end of the 60s. There's nothing else that I've seen that has her in, but she's very good in this as well. I've heard of her mother. Her mother was Thora Heard, who was uh, sort of an actress, comedian, who was very famous when she was still alive. I, I remember seeing a news piece on her when she died. I never knew that she had a daughter who starred in a really high quality Hammer thriller film from the early 60s. That's really cool. There's a really clever part of the script in this when Tony confides in Elena that he's an imposter. And I swear if this was any other TV show or film or anything else, she would have reacted by getting really angry and the script writer would have considered that to be good drama. But that's not how Elena reacts. She instantly forgives him. 
because her desire for Tony to be the man of her dreams completely outweighs any ill feeling she has that he might have betrayed her. She doesn't care that much about the fact that he might have been trying to get his fingers in the estate. All she cares about is the fact that she's finally found a man who can look after her and love her. And I, I found that an interesting thing about the character, but her performance is absolutely top notch as well. I have to say, I did not guess any of the twists that come along in the second half of this. I'm not entirely sure what I predicted would be the outcome of this story. I think I was just happy being swept along by it. I thought they were going for a sort of supernatural thing at one point when Elena kept seeing Tony, Imposter Tony, in the garden. But this film does a very good job of not revealing its secrets until it wants you to know them. And until then, it will just spin you around in several different directions. The best example of this is when. Simon gives imposter Tony the challenge of trying to find his brother's old bedroom and he ultimately ends up getting presented with four options and he pauses as if he doesn't know where the bedroom is so you're thinking to yourself okay well he's an imposter then but then he calmly walks to the correct bedroom so then you think oh so this is actually his brother but why the pause and then in almost the same take he walks into the bedroom goes up to the wardrobe and calmly reaches up on top of the wardrobe to find the key for it so then you're thinking, OK, so it's definitely the brother. He has the information of where the wardrobe key is. But then later on, it turns out that he's an imposter. So presumably his accountant friend, partner in crime, told him about that key. You see, you get presented with so many different pieces of evidence that, that could have taken this story in either direction. Now, as much as I enjoyed it, I do have some niggles that I want to talk about, some negatives. So firstly, there's this really dodgy moment of back projection where Elena is stood against this cliff top. I think she's thinking about committing suicide. Now, I get that back projection was something very common in old films, but we're not talking about James Bond driving along in a car chase here. This is just a static scene of someone stood still. So I don't know why they couldn't have filmed that properly, unless it was a late pickup shot or they couldn't quite figure out how to get a camera crew down to the base of the cliff. I don't know. An even bigger negative is the ease with which Imposter Tony finds the body of Simon's brother. I mean, he literally backs into this wall and his elbow sort of nudges the wall a little bit and then a crack appears and then it's easy to just reach in and, and find the body. I'm sure with all the years that have passed between Simon killing his brother and the present day, he could have barricaded up that wall something good so that nobody would have ever have gotten inside. Unless, and this is possible, he deliberately wanted to leave a little crack there because he wanted to talk to his brother from time to time. Because in the, in the, in the finale of this film, it's very much implied that Simon still sort of thinks that his brother is still alive. That's what he's convinced himself of anyway. It's just in the way that he sort of hugs the corpse towards the end as if he, he, he thinks that the spirit of his brother is still in there somehow. I'd have been fascinated to know what Simon was planning on doing with his wealth, if he had managed to inherit it, if Imposter Tony hadn't come along, presumably just drank himself to death, or possibly he would have invested in a, a gold casket for his brother. I think he's more interested in his dead brother than his girlfriend in this film, at least from what I can tell. My final complaint, I guess, would be just the lack of an epilogue. I would have liked one more scene between Elena and imposter Tony. I don't think he tells her his real name at any point towards the end of this film. If he does, I can't remember it. But yeah, I would have liked one more scene between those two where they just talk about what they're going to do now that Simon's dead and the fire's happened, etc. It's so often the case with these old Hammer films and other films, to be fair, where you get the big set piece, you get the fire, and then it's immediately cut to credits. You know, the director's name will come up on screen with a fire still crackling away in the background. But most of the niggles I have about this film are fairly small, and I'm not even sure that my complaint about the, the thin wall in front of the body is even a legitimate complaint now that I think some more about it. So on the whole, I think Paranoiac is a very good drama thriller. I'm really pleased that I checked it out and I'm looking forward to watching it a second time because I think it will be fascinating to watch it knowing what happens later on in the film. So I can watch the characters of Simon and his aunt 
keep an eye on their facial expressions now that I know what they know, if you see what I mean. Now, before I get to the score that I'm going to give for this film, let me quickly show you the version that I've got. Here it is. Uh, it's one of those where you get a Blu-ray and a DVD in the same box. And curiously, the DVD is written down here as being 76 minutes long and the Blu-ray is 81 minutes long. So I'm not sure if they've added on some more scenes for the Blu-ray or if the DVD version just plays a bit quicker. There's also a making of documentary, which I've not checked out yet. I'm going to. There's also a trailer, which I'm not going to watch because usually old trailers are hideous, in my opinion. Right, let's get to that score. We've got one, two, three. Three and a half bloody axes out of five. I think that aptly demonstrates how much I enjoyed Paranoiac, and it's definitely inspired me, I think, to check out some of Hammer's more... Well, some more of their thriller type movies rather than just the horror ones. I'm not sure right now what my next Hammer review is going to be, but there will definitely be another one very soon. Until next time, cheerio, bye-bye.